In this video, I'm going to add a heads-up display to our pawn with health and power progress bars. Since this is a network-based game, we'll add code to sync our progress bars between the server and clients. I'll be building off the Flybot project I've created in previous videos. There's a link for these down below, as well as a link for the project files on GitHub. When adding a heads-up display or any other type of user interface to an Unreal project, you have a few different options. One way is to derive from the AHUD class, which provides a canvas you can draw on with primitive functions. For example, you can draw lines or rectangles or text directly on it with C++ code. While this will run fast, it's hard to build up complex UIs with these primitive functions. Another way is the Slate framework, which provides you with a number of widgets for building up more complex UIs. It's still in C++, but uses a nested and declarative syntax that makes it a bit easier. Much of the Unreal Editor is actually built using Slate. Another option, as the Slate documentation actually suggests, is to use UMG, or Unreal Motion Graphics. This also provides a set of widgets, which are actually wrappers for the Slate widgets, but you can edit these visually inside of the Unreal Editor. It also integrates well with Blueprint, so it's nice if you don't know C++. In this video I'll be using UMG and doing the layout in the editor, but I'll be interacting with it using a custom C++ class. While the official documentation on the Unreal website is pretty decent for all these systems, I highly recommend BenUI, which has a great introduction for working with Unreal UIs, as well as examples of how to work with C++ and UMG widgets. To get started with adding our heads-up display to our pawn, we'll first create a new C++ class in our project. Let's open up our project directory in Windows Explorer, go to Source, then Flybot, and then create two new empty files called flybotplayerhud.h and .cpp. Back in the main project directory, right-click on flybot.uproject and go to Generate Visual Studio Project Files. This will update the solution to include our new class files. Then open up the flybot solution file in Visual Studio. From the Solution Explorer, let's now open these new files up. In the header file, let's declare a new class called uflybotplayerhud. This derives from uuserwidget, which is a UMG class we can extend for creating our own custom widgets. Later on, we'll further extend this in the editor with a blueprint to do the layout, but having the base class in C++ allows us to easily interact with the widget using other C++ code. We'll want to be able to update two different properties from our widget, health and power, so we'll define set functions for each of these. When these get called, we could update any number of elements in our UI, but for now, we'll just have two progress bars. We declare these as U properties so we can override them in the derived blueprints. We'll also pass in the bind widget specifier, which means the blueprints have to override these, as we'll see later on in the editor. In flybotplayerhud.cpp, we'll define the two set functions for health and power. In each case, we simply set the percent of the progress bar that should show as full. This expects a value between 0 and 1, so we can simply divide the current by the max. To make sure this can compile and run, we also need to update our flybot.build.cs file and add umg as a dependent module. Let's build it, run the editor, open the content browser, and then go to the player folder. In here we'll right click, create a new blueprint class, and then use the flybot player HUD we just created as the base class. We'll call it player HUD BP. When we open this up, it doesn't open the normal blueprint editor, it instead opens the widget blueprint editor. The widget editor allows you to visually lay out how you want your UI to look by using other widgets that you can find in the palette on the left hand side. You combine these in a tree structure, but some widgets can't contain other widgets. In other words, some can only be a leaf node. For example, a progress bar can't contain any other widgets inside of it. Some widgets, mainly those under the panel section, can contain any number of child widgets with various options to lay them out. The root of the tree, or our player HUD blueprint, can only contain a single widget, so it usually makes sense to start with one of the panel widgets. At the bottom under Compile Results, you'll notice that there are warnings about Health Bar and Power Bar not yet being bound. This is because we added those progress bars with the Bind Widget specifier in the C++ class. This means our Blueprint class won't compile until we've added those two. For now, let's drag a single progress bar widget to be our root widget. With this selected, we'll now see a number of properties on the right hand side under the Details panel. This will be different for each widget type. For our progress bar, we'll set the default percentage, the background color, and the foreground color. We'll also name it Health Bar, which is one of the required widgets we need to add. If we try to add another progress bar or duplicate our health bar, you'll notice we can't. This is because the root can only contain a single widget. To fix this, we'll use a canvas panel as our root widget. Canvas panels provide a very flexible way to lay out child widgets using anchors. To add our canvas panel, we'll click on the health bar on the left hand side, go to wrap with, and then canvas panel. 
This sets the canvas panel as the root widget, and then the health bar becomes a child widget. If we select the health bar, you'll notice a new section appears in the details panel. This is called the slot, which provides all the options of laying it out inside of the canvas panel. Keep in mind that different panel types will provide different slot options. For canvas panels, you specify where you want to position your child relative to an anchor point. You'll notice the size and position values change as I resize it and drag it around. I want the health bar to appear in the lower left, so I'll set its anchor to be in the lower left. If we reset the position to 0, 0, you'll see that the progress bar appears below our anchor. Since this is outside of the dotted lines of our canvas panel, it means it wouldn't be seen on the screen. You can change how the widget is positioned relative to its anchor by updating its alignment. As I drag the alignment values between 0 and 1, you can see how it changes. We'll use alignment values of 0 and 1 so it appears inside the panel. We'll also set our position value so it appears 20 pixels away from the corner. Next, we'll resize it to be 300 pixels wide and 50 pixels high. As you can see, the progress bar has a stripe pattern even though I have it set to use a solid color. This seems to be a bug in the editor, so to get around it, we're going to create a new material to use as a background image. We'll open up the content browser, go to the materials folder, right click, and then create new material. We'll name it white UI for user interface. Once we open it up, we'll change the material domain to use the user interface setting. As you see, this takes away most of the output options. We want this to be white instead of black, so we'll create a constant 3 vector and then set the color to white. We'll save it, close it, and then go back to the widget editor. Under the details for the progress bar, we'll go to fill image and then change the image to be our new white UI material. You'll see the stripe pattern is now gone, and the green tint we previously had still applies on top of the white material we just added. If we try to compile it, you'll notice we get an error because we're still missing the power bar widget. To fix this, we'll select the health bar, press Ctrl W to duplicate it, rename it to power bar, anchor it in the lower right hand corner, and then update the position and alignment to be set in from the corner. We'll also change the tint to be a magenta color instead of green. When we hit compile, everything works now since we have the two widgets required by the base class. If we go to the level and hit play, you'll notice we don't see the new HUD UI on our clients. This is because we're not adding it to the client viewport yet. To fix this, let's open up flybotplayerpond.h and add two new properties. The first will be the class to use for our heads-up display. We'll set this to the widget blueprint later on. The second property is an instance of this class that we'll create. This allows us to easily update the health and power later on. At the top of this file, we'll also add begin play and end play overrides. This is where we'll create and destroy our player HUD class and attach it to the viewport. At the top of flybotplayerpond.cpp, we'll add two new header files. The first is our flybotplayerhud header file, so we can access members of the base class. And the second is userwidget.h. This contains a create widget function that we'll use to create instances of our player HUD widget. In the player pond constructor, we'll set our two new properties to null. Even though this isn't needed since uObjects zero out all memory when created, I still like to set a value for every property in the constructor. Next, just above the tick function, we'll add the begin play definition. After calling the parent version, we'll first check that the player HUD class is set and that it's locally controlled. This is because we only want to create these widgets when there's an actual user and screen connected to this pawn. We don't want to create widgets for remotely controlled pawns. When we create a widget, it has to be owned by something, and in our case, we want it owned by the local player controller. This is because the player controller will have references to the local player and the viewport attached to it. Once this is created, we add it to the player screen. Next, we'll add the definition for end play. If we have a player HUD instance, we'll call remove from parent to remove it from the player's viewport. We'll then set the instance pointer to null. The garbage collector will clean it up once it's safe to do so. Let's build it, run the editor, open up the content browser, and open up the player pond blueprint inside the player folder. In here you'll see the new player HUD class property appears, and we can set it to the player HUD blueprint we created earlier. If we compile, save, and hit play, you'll see the heads up display now appears in our clients. Before adding code to update the progress bars, I'd like to add some icons next to the progress bars to indicate health and power. I could find some icons to use online, but I'm going to make my own using GIMP, a free image editing program. Any other image editing program could work as well. For both the icons, I drew an outline of the shape, feathered the edges a bit so they appear soft, and then saved them as PNGs with a transparent background. Back in Unreal, we'll import these as texture objects inside of the player folder. Next, we'll open up our player HUD blueprint, right click on our health bar, and then wrap with a horizontal box. This is a panel widget that stacks child widgets next to each other horizontally. 
We'll drag a new image widget down into the horizontal box next to the health bar. We'll order it so the image widget appears first. We'll update the slot details for the health bar to fill the space. For the new image widget details, we'll rename it to health icon, set the image to be the new texture we just imported, and then set the size to 50 by 50. We'll also give it some padding to the right so it's not right next to the progress bar. Last, we'll update the size of the horizontal bar so that the progress bar is a little bit wider. Now, let's follow the same process to add the power icon next to the power bar. If we compile, save, and hit play, you'll now see the icons on our clients. I feel like the padding between the icons and the progress bar is a bit too much, so I'm going to go back into the blueprint and update the padding to be 10 instead of 20. This looks a bit better to me. The next thing we need to do is start tracking health and power for the pawns, and then update the progress bars as needed. Let's start by opening up flybotshot.h and adding two new properties. Health delta will be how much to change the pawn's health property by when it gets hit. Power delta will be how much to change the pawn's power by when it shoots. Power will act sort of like the ammo for these shots, and it will slowly regenerate over time. In flybotshot.cpp, we'll initialize both of these properties to negative 1. Down below in the onHit function, we'll add some code to update the health when the shot hits a target. We'll first cast both the target and the shooter to flybot player pawns. We then check to see if the target cast succeeds, because we only care when we're hitting another pawn. It doesn't matter if we're hitting a wall or some other object in the world. We also make sure the target is not the shooter, just to make sure pawns can't damage themselves. Next, we make sure we have authority over the target, which means this code is running on the server. If all this is true, we'll call a update health function that we'll add shortly to the pawn. At the top of this file, we'll also include flybotplayerpawn.h, since we're now calling a member of this class. In flybotplayerpawn.cpp, we'll update the try shooting function to set the instigator when we successfully spawn a new shot. We called get instigator in flybotshot.cpp, so we need to make sure to set it here so that call succeeds. In flybotplayerpawn.h, we'll add some properties and functions for tracking the pawn's health. We'll add a max health property, as well as a health property that goes down every time it gets shot. Health will only change on the server and then replicate down to the clients. When the clients get an update, it will call the onrep health function. We'll also add the update health function that we're calling from the shot code we just added. In flybotplayerpawn.cpp, we'll set some default values in the constructor. We'll have a max health of 25, and then start the pawn's health at this max value. Down in the get lifetime replicated props function, we'll add a new line so the pawn starts replicating the health property. We'll add a condition to only update the owner, since this is the only client that will have a heads up display for this pawn. Down in begin play, we'll add a call to set health on our player HUD to set the starting value, and then at the end of this file, we'll add our two new health functions. The first is onrep health, which only gets called on the clients when the health property is updated. For this, we'll simply update the health on our player HUD. Next, we have the update health function that gets called on the server to apply the health delta to our pawn. We simply add the health delta and then clamp it to make sure it's still between zero and max health. When the health property changes here, it will get replicated down to all the clients. In a future video, we'll add some code to eliminate this pawn when the health reaches zero. When we build and test it in the editor, you can see the pawn's health bar starts at full and goes down when it gets shot. We now need to add some code to track and update the power for the pawn. Let's open up flybotplayerpawn.h and add some new properties in a function. We'll have max power and power properties similar to what we did with health, except we won't replicate power down to all the clients. The server and all clients will track this independently. The server will still be the authority, but this allows the shooting client to use client-side prediction, and all other clients to have a close approximation of when shots can happen. We next have a power regenerate rate property, which determines how much power to regenerate during every tick, as well as a new function we'll call during tick for regenerating power. In flybotplayerpawn.cpp, we'll add some defaults for these new properties in the constructor. Max power and power will start at 25, and the power regeneration rate will be one unit per second. In begin play, we'll set the player HUD starting values for power like we did health, and in the tick function, we'll add a call to regenerate power. At the bottom of this file, we'll define this function. In here, we multiply the power regenerate rate by the delta seconds for this tick, and then add this to power. We then clamp it to stay between zero and max power. If we have a player HUD, we also update the new power value there. Last, in the try shooting function, we'll add some code to make sure we have enough power to shoot, and then update the power when we successfully spawn a new shot. We don't want to spawn a shot if we don't have enough power, so we get the power delta from the class's default object. This is an instance of the class that the engine keeps internally. We then update our shooting condition to make sure we have enough power based on the power delta. 
if we do spawn a new shot, we update the power with the power delta and then update our player HUD if we have one attached. If we build it and test it, you can see our power now starts full and it drops a little bit every time we shoot. You'll also see it's constantly regenerating from our tick function. If we drain the power all the way to the bottom by constantly shooting, we start shooting one shot per second, which makes sense because our regeneration rate is one per second and every shot takes one unit. Even though this is a very simple heads up display, it shows the data flow from C++ code to a custom UMG widget. We could easily add more data driven widgets to the HUD to display other game state, such as time remaining, the number of other players in the game, or even an inventory or item system. In a future video we'll also use custom user widgets for the menu system when the game starts. In the next video, we'll add a crosshair to the display to help with aiming. We'll also update the shooting code to make sure this is accurate, because we're currently shooting from the front of the pond, not necessarily where the camera is directly pointing. If you have any questions, be sure to ask in the comments down below. Thanks for watching.